Welcome to Headlines with the Haddads. I'm your host, Emily Schrader. And I'm Yosef Haddad. We are here in New York City this week, bringing you a special edition of Headlines with the Haddads. But first, let's talk about the recent wave of violence hitting Israel. So Israel has suffered from over 10 terror attacks just in March, many of which were deadly. So today we're going to do things a little bit different and have a conversation as Israelis about why this is occurring. Right. So obviously, Yosef, this all began a few weeks ago. And actually, we've seen a lot of terror attacks in March. Some ISIS actually claimed responsibility for, some were claimed by Fatah, and some were actually committed by Israeli Arabs. Mm -hmm. So from your perspective as an Israeli Arab yourself, why is this happening? What is the motivation? So I would like to call this the New Middle East. And I'm calling it like that because the day one of the biggest terror attacks that happened in Israel, the foreign ministers of Morocco, Bahrain, Egypt, UAE, and obviously uh, Israel, uh, they uh, held a huge uh, meeting in the Negev um, to talk about uh, uh, the relationship, to strengthen the relationship between th those countries. And this is something huge because, you know, for the first time, Arab countries from the Middle East come to Israel to strategically talk about how can all of us cooperate together. And this really get on the nerve of the terrorist organizations. The extremists, right. Extremists, terrorists, we're talking about Hamas, we're talking about uh, uh, Fatah, we're talk which is the Palestinian Authority. Uh, uh, for those who are, uh, you know, are surprised for saying that, keep in mind that the Palestinian Authority is paying uh, uh, the family of terrorists and terrorists in prison uh, for what they do when they come and attack uh, Israelis. Uh, we're talking about Hezbollah. We are talking about Iran, which Iran is leading all, uh, uh, all this. So for them to see that this new Middle East happening, this is something that they cannot uh, accept. And now uh, we've seen that ISIS are uh, joining the party by recruiting Arab Israelis. We need to understand one thing. As an Arab, as someone who comes from the Arab-Israeli society, uh, those terrorists, they will never, and they are not representing of the Arab society in Israel. Uh, this is a, a very important uh, uh, point, because I've heard so many people are talking about, oh my God, that's it, the Arab-Israeli society now, yeah. you know, showing their, no, 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 it's absolutely extreme minority uh, that, uh, that uh, 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 we will manage all of us together, Jews and Arabs in Israel, uh, to shut down as fast uh, as possible. So th this is basically why it's happening. The new Middle East that I like to call uh, the new era of the Middle East. So they the are, extremists are angry. They are very <laughs> angry, very yeah. angry, yeah. Not that they weren't angry before, but... In Not regards more, to more now. <laughs> yeah, definitely. In regards to the press, I know for me, I saw at least in the Western media that it almost wasn't being covered. And the thing that was really interesting for me about this is that there weren't the victims of these attacks. The eleven people who were killed, they weren't just Israelis. That there were actually two Ukrainians, two Ukrainians who were killed, yep. despite the fact that right now there's an effort on the Palestinian side to portray Ukraine as being the same as Palestine, and then actually it's Ukra Ukrainians being killed in terror attacks. But in addition to that, not that they aren't Israeli, of course, but there were Arabs and Jews and Druze who were actually killed in these attacks. It's it, it's quite un, uh, unbelievable, and uh, and the, the the coverage I think it's uh, it was uh, so biased uh, that we can see that uh, many of the uh, uh, media, and I'm not speaking about the Arab media because we will talk about that. But uh, as your perspective, when you see the headlines, what what is your first thought about it? Like I mean I mean aren't you like? Uh, well, it's only part of the picture. It's part of the picture. You know, you see a headline from BBC saying. Um, you know, a Palestinian was, was shot. Palestinian was shot because he had just stabbed and killed four people, including Arabs and Jews. So it's just lacking the whole context. No matter who is right at the end of the day, it's lacking the context. And that's the one thing that I noticed about this, uh, this entire wave of, wave of terror that we're seeing, but, seeing but, now. But, but here's the thing. Uh, and uh, speaking of the, uh, from the Arab point of view, uh, and uh, in, in, in the Arab world, the coverage was plus minus similar to uh, similar to the West. To or? the West, but okay. but the difference was in the local Arab Israeli coverage, uh, because uh, in the uh, in the big pages and the newspapers of uh, of the uh, Arabs in Israel, 
the headline was very clear. Terrorist attacks uh, in, in Israel. ISIS attack in Israel. Which means they were very clear about it from the beginning. And I was very, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say happy when, when events like this. Yeah. But very uh, uh, satisfied to see that uh, the headline was, uh, was correct. Uh, you know, uh, defying it as it is, which is a terror attack. Uh, on uh, on uh, on Israel, and uh, we've seen that uh, these attacks, you know, killed uh, Jews and Arabs, not only uh, just Jews, which we understand that you know terrorism doesn't discriminate between uh, Jews and Arabs. Right. Uh, and uh, and uh, we we saw also Yazan Falah, who's uh, uh, who is a Druze from the Druze community, and we saw Amir Khouri, uh, an Arab from the Christian community. Uh, by the way, Amir Khouri is a hero. A hero in the Israeli Yeah, society. he's the one who went into the attack itself. Yeah, a, and and after he was hit, we'll, we'll show the coverage. Yeah, so he's an Arab policeman who just stormed into that terrorist and tried to stop him. Actually managed to stop him. Mm -hmm. But while uh, he's doing that, he was shot uh, and, uh, and killed. Yeah, and, 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 and interestingly enough, this is a very, very representative of Israeli society in a tragic way. But this attack actually occurred uh, by a Palestinian who had entered illegally into Israel in an ultra orthodox oh, community, Correct. and the policeman who ended up preventing further casualties in the attack was an Arab himself. We need, we need to understand that when we say further casualties, it could have yeah, like it could have gotten much worse of uh, of uh, of uh, Israelis being uh, being killed. And yeah, I mean. Saying that an Arab saved uh, uh, Jews. Yeah. But, 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 and as but Israelis, people, for us, it's yeah, not that yeah, unusual, yeah, yeah, but not people unusual, don't know. But, <laughs> yeah. but I'm saying it because the, the, the message, when we sent it to the, to the people around the world, they would go, oh Wait, my what? God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but no, it's very, very common. It happens, policemen, uh, 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 firemen, you, you have all of it from all the uh, communities in, uh, in, uh, in Israel. And I think this is something that we need to, to, to share with everyone. There was another another thing that I noticed. I mean, we've seen in the past that sometimes when terrorist attacks occur in Israel, there is a celebration of it in Gaza mm. or in the West Bank. And unfortunately, we saw a similar reaction from some of the communities in Correct. both the West Bank and Gaza. They were passing out sweets. They had a rally to support the terrorists in, in one city, the city that the, that the terrorist was actually yeah, from. Um, I'm wondering, we saw that there were, there, one of these attacks was actually committed by an Isra Israeli Arab who had pledged allegiance to ISIS. Yeah. What is the response in the Israeli Arab society versus the Palestinian society to these acts of terror? So let's start from the beginning. Unfortunately, extremists are in every society, in every community. We know that. Uh, we say that it's unfortunately, and I really hope that the majority of that silent voice who are far away from those, uh, you know, ideology of those extremists. I hope that we, we will, you know, all of us, Jews and Arabs, and, and even in the entire world, because we've seen it again in every society, that we will overcome those uh, extreme voices. The difference was very clear. You'd seen in Gaza and you'd seen in the West Bank, uh, in some places, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, giving sweets and very happy, yeah. celebrating, but in the... Arab-Israeli society, the absolute majority of that uh, community, you know, not only condemned that, but finally came out publicly and spoke about it, which was a very huge difference between what happened in last May during the Operation uh, Garden Wall, which the, and, and the lynching and the riots yeah, between Jews and right. Arabs. Mm -hmm. now, now, back then, most of the Arab society, the community in Israel, they kept silent because they were afraid of the extremists to, you know, retaliate and come back and they, and they attack them as well. But this time it seems that it was very obvious that it's against the values of each and every one that they had to stand up and speak out against it. And that's what happens. Now, again, there are... We actually, minorities. we also saw this from the international community, yep. which was the first time that's happened. You mentioned the Negev summit, so all of the Arab foreign ministers actually condemned that. Yep. That's never happened. Yep. And then we had other weird things happening, like we had Turkey issuing a strong condemnation. He called the Israeli president to, uh, to condemn the recent terror attacks, and this has definitely never happened. And in fact, Turkey's been aligned with, with Hamas, the terror group in Gaza. Much it's a frustrating situation for those extremists. But yeah. understand, what they want to do 
is to make sure that Turkey stays allies with Hamas. They want to make sure that the Middle East and, and, and what's going on right now in the Middle East, you know, turn up again to the opposite side where Israel is being, you know, uh, uh, condemned. Israel is being banned, right. isolated. Exactly, that's the exact word that I was looking for. And it's not working for them. Yeah. Because step by step, we're seeing that Israel is part of the Middle East and we've seen that the Arab countries in the Middle East are accepting and wanting Israel to be part. That's the benefit of this uh, Abraham Accords, uh, yeah. which we have. And, and to, to seems to be expanding. <laughs> it seems only yeah. expanding, hopefully, you know. Uh, uh, I guess peace so is contagious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we, we want that. And, 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 and last thing about the, the comments, I mean, uh, we have this footage, actually, of, the, of uh, one of the relative of uh, the the terrorist uh, who committed yeah. the Nebrak uh, attack, which this Amir Khouri, which Amir Khouri, uh, the Arab Israeli uh, uh, stopped. Uh, and you should just see that, how she was very satisfied and happy that uh, he committed this, uh, this attack. It's, it's unbelievable. And uh, let's just watch it and, and see what we're talking about. Allah is not like you. There are no like you. يعني احنا تفاجئنا لما سمعنا الخبر بس لما شفنا شفنا الفيديو كيف كان ماشي بكل ثقة وكأنه ماشي في ساحة بيت وكل طلقة هي صائبة يعني هذا شعور ما منقدرش نوصفه وإحنا حزنين على فراقه على البعد ونفس الشيء مفرحان إنه شهيد It's really unbelievable yeah. It's really yeah. unbelievable And so th th this is what what they represent but in the Israeli society, the vast majority of Jews and Arabs, they want to live in partnership. And they are absolutely against this kind of behavior and this kind of uh, talks. So I think we should be very, very optimistic, even during those hard, hard times where we lost very good people. Yeah, uh, I, was and, saying, and I was saying the other day to, to a friend that it's almost like it's a terrible time. <laughs> it's very difficult for all of us, Arabs and Jews and Israel, but it's a little bit, there's almost a silver lining because the way that people have responded actually gives me hope. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and uh, uh, it's the same for me. I really, really feel, feel hopeful. Uh, we, 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 are, we are going in a, in, a, in a good direction against all those uh, extremists. So, yeah, hope. That's, uh, that's the best way to finish this uh, talk. All right, moving on to our next segment. There has also been unrest in Iran over this past week with a massive protest against Iran's ban on women in football matches. Yes, in Iran, women are forbidden from pretty much everything, from attending sports events in the stadium, along with a host of other activities like dancing and singing. Um, so this past week at the football match between Lebanon and Iran, well, the men were playing inside and enjoyed the sporty atmosphere. The women outside the stadium were literally pepper sprayed and tear gassed. This incident occurred because FIFA actually wouldn't allow Iran to sell tickets that discriminated based on gender following a similar controversy back in 2019 in which FIFA demanded to Iran that they allow women to attend these sporting matches. As a result, 2,000 Iranian women purchased tickets for this event, for this match, only to be attacked by Iranian regime police outside of the stadium. Check it out. The response, understandably, has been outrage. Activists have spoken out strongly in defense of Iranian women. The U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee has called on FIFA to hold the Iranian Football Association accountable for these activities and their recent actions. There have also been calls to ban Iran from the FIFA World Cup as a result. Some brave Iranian journalists and athletes have done the same, with one even stating that the actions of the regime in this incident are clear evidence of Iran's gender discrimination.
The organization United for Navid, a group of exiled Iranian athletes and activists set up after the execution of wrestling champion Navid Afkari in September 2020, they actually said Iran should be suspended from international football completely until it changes its stance. They penned a letter to FIFA calling for Iran's immediate suspension over this incident. And yet, instead of Iran apologizing for the incident, their official response was that tickets purchased by the women had been sold by ticket forgers and that the women did not reveal they were female when they bought these tickets online. I didn't know that apparently women need to reveal their gender when purchasing tickets. Thank God I don't live in Iran. Yeah. Keep in mind, Iran was also selected to serve on the Women's Rights Committee in the United Nations just a week ago. So the fact that this is occurring now is especially alarming. While pressure continues to mount, FIFA has yet to respond to the outrage with meaningful action. Only time will tell if the football body will take the necessary steps to stop the discrimination against women in Iran. And now for something a little different. It's happened quite few times that pro-Palestinian activists have used historical examples to show how Palestine exists prior to the state of Israel in an attempt to uh, demonstrate Jews are not from the land of Israel. Here's one example from the supermodel, Bella Hadid. And here's another from her father, multimillionaire, Muhammad Hadid. Now, obviously, Arabs have existed in the land of Israel for centuries. But it might be surprising to learn that the real history of a few of those examples, which are frequently used to prove Palestinians' history, Right, so not everything is quite what it seems when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict on social media. I know that's shocking. <laughs> Things are fake on social media. Yeah. So here's actually the first example, a coin which states very clearly Palestine in English and also in Arabic. Um, and this coin actually dates back to 1927, before the establishment of the state of Israel. Yet it also states Palestina Eretz Israel, meaning the land of Israel in Hebrew. Now why? Because under the British mandate, Arabs and Jews both lived in the territory and had been living here for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. That being said, Palestine wasn't actually ever a state, rather a region which got its name from the Romans. Yeah, another example is this football match footage from 1939, Israel versus Australia. Now, this footage was actually shared by Muhammad Hadid, but if you look closer, you can see that the logo of the Palestinian team is actually Jewish Star of David. <laughs> That's because this team, the Palestinian football team, their official name, was primarily made up of Jews who were actually from the land of Israel. And this team was Maccabi Tel Aviv, a football team. team that still exists today. And yes, your favorite <laughs> football team. <laughs> All right. So the Palestinian Symphony Orchestra, founded in 1936, was an orchestra made up exclusively of Jews that later changed its names to the Israeli Philharmonic. And this, this is a picture from the Palestinian Airways was founded in 1937 by a Jewish man in conjunction with the Jewish Agency for Israel. The Jerusalem Post, where I'm actually a columnist, was initially named the Palestine Post, and it was actually founded in 1932 by a Zionist Jew named Gershon Agron in Jerusalem, and it was the first English newspaper at the time. And last but not least, there's the Palestinian passport, as Emily mentioned. This passport wasn't for the state of Palestine, much less an Arab state of Palestine, but rather the region as occupied by the British. In fact, even Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir had a Palestinian passport. Check out this footage. From 21 until 48, I carried a Palestinian passport. There was no such thing in this area as Jews and Arabs and Palestinians. There were Jews and Arabs. There's actually a long history of Arab and Jewish presence in the land of Israel, but using these Palestinian historical examples in an attempt to claim Jews didn't have a presence here prior to 1948 isn't really making the point that I, I think they nope. that these activists think think they are making. Yeah, it's just a terrible take. And speaking of terrible takes, this is the time for the best and the worst take of social media. Yes. So I actually finally have a good take. Um, the last, <laughs> I know, I know, for, for like three weeks we've had only, only bad takes. So uh, a couple of days ago, I guess maybe a week ago, um, there was a video that was released by a Israeli Arab Muslim. Mm -hmm. um, he's a rapper. He's actually been on, I think, like Israel's Got Talent and stuff. But he did this video in response to a lot of the terror attacks. And this actually plays into what you were saying about how the response has been yeah. different of the Israeli Arab society. But he did a, 
a video strongly condemning this and calling on the Muslim community also to like join him in, in condemning this. He is from Baka al Gharbiya and he called himself Mo the Rapper. Mo the Rapper, yeah, yeah Mo the Rapper. Yeah. So we'll play a, a clip of this. Let's check, let's check it. Because this is not the right way to solve things and this is not the right way to live and this is not the right path to choose. This is not. And now, what about me? I have a family. How can I explain to my son or to my daughter in the future this is this is not it doesn't represent your religion or it doesn't represent your family your mother and father how can i teach them how can i tell them that now if you walk in the street you're not in danger yes you are yes you are because of terrorists because of terrorists if you walk in the street right now they might kill you they just might kill you oh and what they think they think oh we just we just want to kill jews oh you want to kill jews why 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 you want to kill? That was a really good take, Emily. <laughs> for <laughs> once, for once, I well, have a, I have a good take. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm going to be the, the, the bad guy here. The bearer of bad news. <laughs> and okay. I'm going to bring the bad news. And actually, it was quite frustrating to see a member of Knesset, uh, Moseraz, from uh, Meretz. Uh, he uh, tweeted... Uh, about Amir Khouri. We've already talked uh, in this episode about Amir Khouri, the Israeli hero, the Arab Israeli hero, who, you know, who stopped uh, the terror attack in Bnei Bre- uh, Brak. But uh, Mossi Ras found it uh, um, that, that uh, he needs to go and represent uh, Amir Khouri as a Palestinian citizen of Israel. And he tweeted this uh, tweet saying that uh, Amir Khouri is Palestinian. Now, I was outraged, but not only me. Uh, the family of Amir and the, uh, a lot of the Israeli Arab society were outraged by this. I mean, who are you to determine uh, my identity, our identity, his identity? Uh, by categorizing us or by defining us, uh, uh, don't get me wrong. Everyone should entitle to define himself as he wants. So if there is Arab in Israel, and by the way, it's about maybe 7 to 14 percent of the Israeli society, Arab society, that define themselves as Palestinians, they are free to do that. But when someone, whether it's from the Jewish community or from the Western uh, world or any other world, not f- from our society, comes and defines us and tells us, who are we? I have a huge problem with that. So unfortunately, yeah. he came out uh, as a bit of imbecile when he <laughs> did that. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but this is the situation. We are Arab Israeli citizen, and don't try to define us. Do your job, don't define <laughs> us. No, I'm, 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 right. I'm, I'm it really, <laughs> really pissed me off. All right, so that's, that's our bad take. We had a good take and a bad take for this week. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for joining us. I'm your host, Emily Shader. I'm Yusuf Haddad. See you next time.